Um, thank you everybody for joining us tonight. Uh, this is, um, you know, our third, uh, our third sort of episode in this uh, series of town halls that we're going to be doing all the way up till election day. Uh, me and Brian uh, want to do a few things with these town halls. We want to encourage people to be uh, active in our politics. We want to encourage people to be informed, and uh, we want to we want to encourage as much discussion as possible within our communities. Uh, tonight we have um, just just an awesome awesome uh, discussion plan. We've been waiting on this for a while, and we finally made it happen. Uh, we're going to talk about social justice in America because as uh, we approach this election, um, I don't think any any of us ever saw this coming, but uh, but it's here, right? This is a discussion that we all need to have. And if we don't have this discussion with our friends, with our family, uh, we're really not doing uh, justice to the situation and to the election that's coming up. So we're gonna be talking about social justice in America. We're gonna be talking about Black Lives Matter. We're gonna be talking about um, a bunch of topics tonight with our amazing guests. We have Kyle Richard tonight and Michael Hines. Um, the two former students who have just become successful and are ve very involved in these movements. And of course, I have uh, Brian here with me tonight. Brian, how you doing? I'm doing well, Don. Um, a lot going on. A lot going on. Um, hopefully you guys are paying attention at home. Uh, aside from everything we're going to talk about with Mike and Kyle tonight, uh, even in the last 72 hours, a lot to talk about. Uh, so before Great. we get to Mike and Kyle and we start talking about uh, social justice, which is going to be our focus tonight. Um, Don, there's a lot of things I'd like to talk about with you before. Um, yeah. and, and I think we can maybe start with polling, Don. Um, if, you look at some, yeah, if you look at some of the polls, um, Biden is increasing his lead overall, uh, particularly in, the, in, the, in those battleground states, those swing states that we've talked about. Uh, you know, maybe those six or seven states that are really going to determine the election. Um, what do you think led to that, Don? Well, the average national poll, the poll of polls, has Biden up by about nine points, 50 to 40, uh, 41. Um, and, but of course, as uh, those of you that listen to us uh, either in class or, um, or on, this, uh, on these town halls know that we don't have a national election. We have an election based on specific swing states. And when you look at these swing states, Biden is up by a lot in all of these states that Trump won in 2016. Michigan being the closest one uh, from 2016, Biden is up 49 to uh, 40 currently. He's, you know, I guess he's maintained that lead since April. In Pennsylvania, again, uh, you know, a major swing state that Trump absolutely has to win. Biden has even a bigger lead, uh, 50 to 39. And you see, if you look at the graphic, you'll notice that Trump won uh, Pennsylvania by less than one percentage point. So Biden being up um, by 11 points in Pennsylvania is bad news for the Trump, uh, for the Trump campaign. Um, Minnesota's on here. This is based off a of Fox News poll, but uh, they didn't poll Minnesota, um, Wisconsin. Um, so I wanted to talk about Wisconsin, which are the three states, so Michigan, Pennsylvania, and Wisconsin. Wisconsin, Biden is up 48-43, according to change research. That's not a Fox News poll. So at this point in the race, um, Donald Trump is losing. And, you know, it looks like he's going to have to kind of shift focus because when we looked at the polls last time, Brian, we talked about areas where Trump was being successful. And one of the areas was the economy. And what do you think he can do to kind of continue to, like we saw economic numbers today, not so good. What do you think he can do to kind of change uh, what, how people feel about the economy or what, the direction the economy is going? I don't think it's going to come down to the economy. I mean, I think one state, let me just throw out there because you didn't mention it, is Florida, which, you all know, right. for me, I think it all comes down to Florida. Trump needs to win Florida. I believe that whoever wins Florida will win the election. Um, you know, Don, let me ask you this question, then I'll go back to yours. I mean, I, I think if the election was held today, I, I would be comfortable knowing that the polls were wrong last time um, knowing that, you know, that everyone said Hillary's going to win, I would be comfortable saying if the election was today, Trump wouldn't lose. Um, yeah, yeah. But as you know, there's a lot to come here. Uh, first, we lot. have, you know, probably around 90 days left. We have a series of debates. 
we we'll see what happens. And really, it comes down to three things, which um, another thing was a Fox News poll said the other day, the three major things by far that Americans are looking at here is the economy, number one, which Trump is close. You know, some polls have him up by a few points, some points have him down. Um, racial injustice and the coronavirus. So I don't think Trump has to even look at the economy. I, I disagree with you. I don't think, I think the economy, and listen, Trump's going to be able to blame the coronavirus for these sluggish numbers in the economy. You know, I mean, business is They're one in the, but, but this is where we disagree. They're one in the same. The economy and the coronavirus are the same thing. That, that is the same thing. The, the reason why the economy is crashing is because of the coronavirus. And it's the mishandling of the coronavirus is why the economy is crashing. I don't know if I agree with you there. I, I, don't, I just don't agree. I mean, I think the question here is not what's going to happen to the economy now. The question is going to be who, who's best to rebuild the economy once this is over. Yeah. Um, and, you know, listen, some people believe it's Trump. Some people might believe it's Biden. Uh, okay. If I was Trump, I, I wouldn't even look at the economy right now. I, I mean, I think he's got a reverse course on the coronavirus, which we saw him somewhat do. Um, the Republican National Convention in Florida has been canceled, uh, which yeah. is a huge move uh, for Trump and his campaign and the GOP to do. Um, you know how much he wanted. It was originally going to be North Carolina. When North Carolina said he couldn't do it there, he moved it to Florida. Uh, now he's finally conceded that it's just not safe. Um, this, of course, on the heels today of Herman Cain, who's a former presidential candidate, um, who was at the Tulsa rally uh, five days later, you know, developed coronavirus symptoms, had coronavirus, unfortunately passed away today. Um, and then the other big thing is, is the racial injustice, which Trump really is not reverse course on, uh, which is why I think the conversation today is so important. Uh, yeah. So I don't, you know, I, I don't, you know, most years it goes, it comes down to the economy. This year, I, I think Americans want to see leadership with all the turmoil going on in the country and they want to see leadership with the coronavirus. Um, I think that's Trump's his best bet uh, to try to turn these poll numbers around. Yeah, I, I think the, him canceling this convention is a very big deal because I think for Trump, this would have been a big event. This is when he tries to, you know, this is the, a rally uh, on a national level. And the fact that he's not going to be able to do that really um, is going to, I think, I think that hurts him. That probably, that probably hurt. They'll do a virtual one though, right? Yes, do they'll do a virtual one. I mean, listen, he still has the bully pulpit. You still see him out there probably 10 to 1 for Biden. You know, obviously the whole pandemic's hurt Biden as well, who's been more confined to, you know, small interviews and his basement interviews. Um, I, I think Trump will be able to get his message out. I, I think it'll actually help him that he can't say that. How do we know Biden is in the basement? You get, everybody says he's in the basement. I mean, there's no windows. Like, I'm pretty sure he's admitted. First of, all, that's, first of all, that's a very nice basement. My basement doesn't look like that. That's I, wasn't fair. Also, I wasn't a senator and vice president, but he could be in a living room. Why can't we say living room? We got to say basement. Don, if that's what you're picking at, I mean, I don't have to tell you, Don. Um, I, th I thought I read. I thought he said it's his basement. I don't know. <laughs> All right, so he's gonna he's gonna pick a vice president too, right? Um, so we'll see which one of us was uh, closer or right on this one. Because yeah. our first episode, right, we did, uh, we picked who we thought he was going to pick. Yeah, I mean, I, I think a lot of our viewers hopefully saw that there was that list that was kind of, uh, some uh, reporter got a picture of it that showed that it was Kamala Harris and some of the things that uh, he liked about her. Um, yeah. Don, what do you think if it is Kamala Harris? Yeah, um, you know, I, 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 think, I think Kamala is a great pick because right now, as if you look at the polls, He's up by so much in all of these states. He doesn't have to pick somebody to try to squeeze out uh, Pennsylvania or try to squeeze out Michigan or um, squeeze out the Hispanic vote, as you had mentioned, with the governor of New Mexico. I think it's more about, listen, how old is he? 77? He's 77, right? Biden? Yeah, yeah. So he's 77 years old. And, you know, who is going to be ready to lead on day one? And I think that's going to uh, be the most effective message. And, and somebody who's vetted and somebody who is accomplished and a recognizable name is Kamala Harris. So I think it's, I think it's a great pick. Um, those other women are great, but I think Kamala Harris is the best pick. Uh, I think Elizabeth Warren is a good pick too, but I, I think it's between those two right now. I'm surprised that you say that. Um, 
I mean, I think we both agree that with everything going on, it would make sense for him to pick a woman of color. Um, I agree with pretty much everything you said. I, I think Kamal Harris is a safe pick. I think it shows you that the Biden team knows that they're in a good spot now. Yeah. So they don't have to go for that home run. They don't have to go for that Sarah Palin moment where you try to kind of hit a home run. As much as you know, I'd love to see somebody like Stacey Abrams or, or Keisha Lance Bottoms, you know, yeah. and I, I really, I would love to see Biden get Georgia. And, and if you, you know, a few Biden staffers this week said that they're going after Georgia. Um, yeah. As much as I would have loved to see one of those other women, uh, listen, Kamala Harris has the experience uh, ready to go on day one, immensely qualified. She's a safe pick. It's probably the way he will go, and it's probably the way he should go. I think she does, does energize the youth also. Um, I heard there's a thing on Twitter called the K-Hive, um, which is it's, it's like, a, I guess, a playoff Beyonce's Beehive, which, uh, you know, uh, don't mess with Kamala on Twitter. Um, you know, you mentioned Georgia, um, that they're going to campaign in Georgia. The Trump campaign actually pulled all of their ads from Michigan today. Yes. Which yeah. is, that's, I mean, that's very telling of this election. Uh, it's going to be, it's going to be very interesting. All right. So um, I, I think we're going to get into our Q&A with our uh, absolutely awesome guests. So I failed to mention um, prior, I think, I think we have a, a, a good, um, a good uh, number of people now. Two things that we'd like you to do. Uh, first thing that I'd like you guys to do in the chat that's being monitored by our, um, our awesome producer, Zan, right now, um, please leave your email address. Please leave us your email address so we can keep you updated on when we do these town halls. And also, we want to hear from you. So um, definitely please email us. So um, please leave us your email address. And as we go through these questions, so Brian and I have questions for Kyle and Mike. Um, we'd like to hear questions from you also. So as the discussion goes on, or if you've had questions burning in your mind for the last uh, 45 years that you'd like to ask, um, you know, you can absolutely do that. All right. So post the questions in the chat or, um, um, you know, yeah, post the questions in the chat. Okay. All right. So. Uh, Brian, I'm going to have you introduce these young gentlemen because uh, you taught them both, right? Yeah, really special moment for me. Um, I have taught both these great young men. Uh, very, very proud of both of them. Uh, first, we have Mike Hines, who graduated from my, my Far Rockaway days. and He graduated in 2008 from Beach Channel High School. Uh, always one of my favorites there. Uh, since graduating, he, he's uh, graduated from Boston University School of Law in 2016. Uh, he's been practicing law here. Uh, this is something that he's passionate about, and uh, I'm not surprised um, knowing you know, how he was in high school and seeing what he's done since. Um, I, I can't wait to hear what he has to say. And then more recently, Kyle Richard, uh, who graduated from Malvern a few years ago. Uh, he's currently an activist and speaker for sexual, domestic, and gun violence prevention. And more recently, I actually uh, reconnected with Kyle at the Malvern Unity March, which he was one of the main organizers of. Um, and for those of you who don't know what that was or weren't there, um, it was basically a, a unity march. It brought uh, the various parts of Melbourne together for a march to show that uh, Black Lives Matter. Um, Kyle, the whole time, and the other organizers talked about, you know, how important it was to, to remain peaceful and bring the community together rather than making it a divisive event. And um, we walked through the streets of Melbourne, and um, it was really just a great night. And uh, I'm happy to have Kyle here um, and Mike uh, to share some of their experiences and some of their insight uh, about what's been happening here and really where it goes in the future, which I think is where we're starting to look next. Yeah, it's, um, it's really great to have you guys here. And, you know, one of the things I tell my students, and I, I think um, uh, there are a lot of former students or current students um, in, in our chat right now, or maybe watching a, a little bit later, um, is I feel like when, when you're teaching, uh, you want to learn from from your students also. So it's really great to have you guys here. And, and tonight we'd like to really learn from you guys a little bit. Thank you so much for having us. Yeah, no problem. Yes, thank All you right, so much so, for having us. Yeah, no problem. Um, so I want to kind of start off, um, you know, with everything that's going on uh, and with everything we see on the news every day and everything we're involved in, 
I, you know, I, I really feel like a lot of this is quite emotional and um, it's quite, um, maybe it gets tense from time to time, but um, we, we are in a tense environment. And, you know, I just thought of this yesterday uh, because I was talking to a family member who I love, who, um, you know, is upset by the Black Lives Matter movement. And I didn't know how to talk to this person without getting overly personal or without them feeling like I'm attacking them. So the question I have for you guys, and you know, either one of you can start out, um, you guys can decide that. Um, how do I approach this subject that's so tense um, with people I love who may not, um, may not agree with me um, on, on these topics? Mark, do you wanna take that? Um, sure, sure, I can start. I mean, I think that because it is a tense environment, you have to talk about it. Um, I think that, you know, just like with any other important subject in life, any other important subject in society, if we wait for when everyone thinks that it's okay to have the conversation, the conversation mm -hmm. might never happen. And I think that for movements as radical as these, the whole point is to make people feel uncomfortable because you cannot, in my humble opinion, evoke change if everyone is comfortable. I mean, I think the whole point is to make people uncomfortable enough so that there will be change. So the Black Lives Matter movement in, in particular, it's about erasing structures in society that make Black lives inferior to the lives of our white counterparts. And I think if someone is offended by our desire for equity, I would challenge them and I would ask them why Black people do not deserve equity. Mm -hmm. and, and, and I think about it in terms of the bootstrap analogy that comes out a lot, right? So we ask people to raise themselves up by their bootstraps when some people don't even have boots, right? I mean, mm -hmm. that, that, that's yeah. pretty unfair. And if we have a society in which a community is severely disadvantaged for you know, hundreds and hundreds of years, why is it such a bad thing to catch them up? And, and, and I think that, you know, maybe the issue that, that white people have is that they see an unfair advantage. And I think that if we are honest about our history, if we're honest about our society, we can clearly see that this society owes black people a lot and that it's going to take a few more generations to make black people whole in American society. You know, after all, if you think about it, Jim Crow was only, what, 40, 50 years ago? You know, there are people alive today that were subject to Jim Crow. Mm -hmm. So, you know, how could, how could anyone uh, with, a, with a sound mind possibly ar argue that Black people are already whole in this society? And to, to address your point about the subject of friends and family, which is a real challenge, and I think mm -hmm. it's particularly a challenge for our older generation, you know, they've been around for a lot longer. And I, I would think that they would be leading the way in this because they've seen so much of the history that we're trying to bring to the forefront. They've been witnesses to this history. And I don't know if maybe, you know, it's, it's a willful ignorance on their part, but I think we have to be taught to rethink all of the assumptions that we've made about how the society should function. And for example, you know, what the role of the police should be in our society, which I know we're gonna tackle later. We have to rethink yeah. those assumptions that we already have. Right. I definitely, I definitely can piggyback off that, um, and I appreciate the way that you went about the older generations and talking about the older generation since it is more of a, a youth movement, especially sparked by a lot of social media. Um, but yeah, the reason why at the Unity March, we the reason why we made the route so much shorter than a long march. Um, is so that we could have older generations there or people that may not have the ability to walk as far. But we knew in my community, I grew up in a black community, and like China mentioned earlier, if you weren't on, um, there's a lot of divisiveness between the two communities. On It's one block of black and Hispanic or Latinx, and then the next block over is all white. And there's, no, there's almost no sense of, of mixing or community between the two other than the school. And I was right. happy enough to be able to go to Melbourne and, and have that experience. But our generation, the older generations were super excited at the Unity March, um, just in our own community, uh, to be able to be a part of something again. And they, every 
single person that's probably over 70 years old that, that was there or 60 years old. Uh, God bless their souls. Even during coronavirus, they were out and about. Um, they, you know, they were really a, such a big part of it and they had the biggest smiles on their face because they were, they really knew that they had to be changed there. They saw the busing problems um, in the 60s and 50s and 60s. They saw Martin Luther King come in our community and, and have to talk about racism and anti-racism and how, how to empower, you know, black people. And to be, to talk about being uncomfortable um, and having the uncomfortable conversations is something that I'm not, uh, I'm not foreign to because just, just, for, just for a survey that was taken, um, it says 94% of people reportedly have had different feelings towards people based on their race, their sex, um, and biases towards race. Um, but only 20% indicated that they were comfortable having a conversation about that bias. And I got that from uh, why are all the black kids uh, sitting together in the cafeteria? <laughs> it's a great resource, especially if you're trying to be an ally in this time. Um, so I definitely would check that out. And uh, uh, if somebody could drop that in the chat, that'd be gr a great resource for people that are looking to be allies during this time. So you have 20% of people that are comfortable having this conversation. A person like me who is multiracial and they grew up with a, a mother who literally just retired today from the police force, retired today after 30 years. So wow, that's awesome. That. Congratulations. That's yeah, awesome. Yeah. yeah. We had to walk out and everything. And then my, my, my black side, which is my father's side and my community and where I was raised, um, I realized early on, and I wrote my senior, uh, my, my, to get my college application on the Common App, I spoke about being colorblind. And that's obviously an outdated thought now. But what I was trying to do in my college application in my, right, in my essay portion was say, since I'm multiracial, I feel like it's, a, it's not a burden, but it's, it's something that I feel like a lot of people that are multiracial in today's day, we are the bridge and we are the people that can have those conversations with people with, unfortunately, it shouldn't have to be that way, but a lot of people feel like they're being targeted. For what I do, sexual and domestic and gun violence, a lot of it's talking about manhood. And when I, if, if you're in a room of men and then a, a woman comes in the room and is talking to you about manhood and masculinity, I believe, and women have been trying to do that for a long time. Obviously, women, indigenous women, black women specifically have faced years and years of oppression through sexual violence, through domestic violence. Um, and they try, they're, they're getting the word out and talking to us, but it's almost like they're falling on deaf ears and it's just a brick wall. But when I get to talk to people, I'm, since I'm a man and talk about manhood, I have an easier connection and it's, it's easier to say, what are we doing here for me? And I, I think that same conversation has to happen with white people, especially in, in their households, because in the households where you learn the most. Yeah. I, I, I'm and John, sorry, let me just, uh, yeah, I kind of, I, I just, you know, you mentioned Melbourne High School, and I think a lot of our, our people here tonight are either teachers or students there. Um, and obviously, it's just one man's opinion, Don. You can jump in if you want. I, I'm always amazed because speaking in terms of Long Island, Malvern is one of the more diverse districts, especially when you look at the surrounding areas. And at the Unity March, we heard, I think, you and other speakers say, I had a great experience at Malvern High School. And I don't know if you could speak to that and maybe what makes it, and I really do believe Malvern's a special place, especially when you look at the world and you watch TV and everyone, everything's so polarizing and divisive. When I teach at Malvern and when I see the students interact at Malvern, I really don't see race issues. And I'm not saying they're not there, but I think we're doing something there that maybe other areas aren't and maybe other areas can learn from. When I was speaking at the Unity March, I mentioned how much I love Malvern and I always will love Malvern. Um, that doesn't go without being said that things do have to be changed. Um, you could love something and still ha want to see better. Like I wore the shirt I wore at the Unity March. It was the most American shirt you could have. It was a bold eagle. It was talking about, you know, unity and, and, and being united and it's the most American shirt. While I'm speaking on the speaking about things we have to change in our community, that's American. And for Malvern, that's Malvern is, is, is being held accountable, holding yourselves accountable. Um, and even though the, t the administration teachers might not see race issues, not even within the school necessarily, but within the community, which is a part of the school at that point, um, right, right on Ocean Ave, right, like right on the main street, uh, we have always, always felt that we were not welcome in Malvern, being Lakey residents, being black kids in, in, the, in the village where the school is. 
Um, there's been multiple uh, times where there were uh, police called on us for walking through Malvern too late for them, too late for their liking. Uh, my friend, my good friend Maxon, was a little kid in middle school walking past the house, laughing, you know, just having fun. A police, somebody calls the police on him. Um, would that happen if, if he was white? I doubt that. But the thing is, you may not hear it, China. You may not hear it, Nadim. You may not hear it straight from the students. It's almost like we became so numb to it. And that's why the mm -hmm. Black Lives Matter movement is so huge now and critical for black people because we were so numb to it. And I, I'm speaking for myself at least that we would joke about it because there was nobody listening. There is not like people cared that there were racist people. And if we said, oh, these people are racist, it's like, oh, it's okay. That's, that's, that's just them. That's just them. Not realizing the impact that it has going forward. Um, and that's, that's huge. You know, Kyle, I, I mean, you, everything you've just said is so uh, impactful and I just relate to that because I'm new to Malvern, newer to Malvern, you know, seven years. And I, I grew up in, um, uh, in an area, Hicksville, which is, uh, there's not as much, um, you know, of that division, right, that, that exists, but mostly a, a working class, middle class, white community for the most part. Um, but one of the things, uh, and I'll just tell a quick story was uh, a student in my second year at Malvern, which I think was your senior year, um, said, uh, said something about um, uh, Cross Island, uh, the, the, the supermarket. And I said, I said, oh, I went to Cross Island and did you guys ever notice that uh, they don't have this? They don't have, uh, you know, whatever, water bottles from whatever. And the girl said to me, she said, we don't go there. And I said, I, and I and I and I like took it back. I was like, "What do you mean you don't go there? It's right there." Mm -hmm. And th this was my kind of newness to this uh, to this community. And I really started to learn all the things that you're saying right now um, about the personal stories that you guys experienced uh, being Lakeview residents. So that's that's really interesting. Thank you for saying all of that. I appreciate it. Yeah, let me jump in, guys. Because one of the things I'd like to do tonight, and obviously you know, being a white person and living in a predominantly white neighborhood, um, you know, I mean, listen, this has been all over the news media. And, you know, I, I can't tell you how many fights I've gotten into with people, how many people I'm not talking to, defriended, the whole thing. You know, one of the criticisms that I hear, and I'm sure you've heard, um, you, you know, you watch a 15-second news clip of, you know, maybe some of these protests that do turn violent or turn destructive. You see people maybe uh, acting in ways that, that they, you know, that they're throwing a brick or destroying something. Uh, certainly not representative of the movement, but you have people who criticize the movement and say, well, look at this. This is what the movement is. It's violent. It's destructive. What would you say to people who are using that kind of as an excuse to either purposely ignore or, or miss the bigger picture here? Michael? Sure. I mean, I, I, I would say that I think that people fail to understand anger. Uh, and I think that uh, Tupac probably said something along the lines of, um, you know, if you're trying to get into a house and you've been knocking on the door nicely and no one lets you in, eventually you're going to kick down the door. You know, so I think that, you know, the des destructiveness and looting uh, is the result of many years of pent up anger, you know, and, and of course it should be mentioned that there is controversy about the looting and destructive behavior and whether there are some rogue elements that are trying to change the narrative of the protest by inciting violence. There's a lot of that as well. But as a general matter, I mean, looting and destructive behavior has always been viewed negatively, even though, you know, meanwhile, we have, uh, you know, white people are sort of allowed to loot and riot for losing the Super Bowl, for winning the Super Bowl, for winning a hockey match, Nobody bats, bats an eye, no one cares. You know, no one calls it destroying your own neighborhood. No one calls it taking away from your own cause. So I think that if we're gonna be critical, we need to be fair about our critiques, right? You know, of course, if a segment of the population has been peacefully protesting for years and years and years over the same thing, it is unreasonable to expect people to just remain peaceful forever. And the irony of this is that American culture, if you really think about it, American culture is built off of violence and using violence as a way to get what you want. This country only responds to violence. 
It doesn't respond to peace. It doesn't respond to peaceful protests. And I think we need to be honest about that history that America has. Yeah, I think it's just, Kyle, you want to jump in or? Oh, no, I, I mean, I'm, I'm just taking and I'm processing that. And, and I definitely do notice uh, a lot of the things that Mike had talked about, um, about the violence. And not to say that I condone the violence. Um, I definitely, there's a reason why I wanted the unity march to be as organized and peaceful as possible. Um, and I do believe that every community is, is vastly different than each other. Like you said, and like uh, Nadim had just said, uh, how he's finding out things about a town that's literally how many towns over from you? Four from where you grew up? Yeah, very close, 15 minutes. That's, that's, that's within a couple miles. Now, across the country, you're talking about all these different places, all these different activists that, are, that have been impacting their communities. You're talking about a whole bunch of different leaders, um, who people look up to. Uh, are some communities gonna respond to peaceful? protest or and and have leaders in place that will actually respond and take black people seriously for once yeah i'm sure there's going to be some of those people but to to act like there aren't hundreds of activists like me i'm not i'm not unique in that sense that we start a march uh with the naacp um my older brother jordan um and we start we start a march to be peaceful that was the overwhelming response that I have gotten from talking to activists across the country about how the, everything is going where they are. But okay. when, there, when there's a dramatic confrontation, that's what's tuned in. And, it's, and I'm saying, it's okay. We know how the news works already. Black people are not new to the news portraying our movements as something that should be diminished and demonized. So it's not a shock to us that, that they were showing only the riots and- But, but that's and, my question. And, if you could, and I'm sorry to interrupt you. But but, that's my question. I do think that the message gets lost in the way it's portrayed. And how do you, as I would say, as one of the leaders of the movement, like how do you respond to that in terms of where does it go from here? And how do you respond? How, how do you get past that? And how do you get past, you know, people saying, oh, that's what it is. I, I don't know if you can, but- uh, That's the media's fault, Brian. I don't this I mean I'm not disagreeing, Don. I just yeah. I'm asking how the movement gets past that. Mm -hmm. Because listen, there's some people who listen, you could have hours and hours of footage and it's gonna come down to a 15 second clip. Yeah. And I and I definitely and what you just said is it could be the media's fault, and you could say it's, it could be the media's fault. Um and I know a lot of people in media and they're just doing their job, quote unquote doing their job. Um but I saw somebody said one time, um is talking about sending the, the messenger and don't send the town idiot to be the messenger for, for big problems, right? And then I, I'd like to counter and say, yeah, that's true, okay. But who listens to the town idiot, right? So if you're only going to listen to one source of information, if you're not gonna go out of your way to listen to people that are literally telling you that's not what it's about, that's not what it's about, and you still say, no, it's leading to this, yeah. go ahead and do that. You can't change everybody's mind, but if you're gonna if you're gonna really talk about this movement seriously, you have to just keep going forward, and that's what I've been doing. Well, all these people that that have are replying or, or commenting terrible things on social media, with social media is, whew, what a tool! You can say whatever you want, and there's no confrontation in person. Um, that's that's you'll see that stuff, and like I said, we have to be strong. We have to we're we're used to it. We shouldn't be used to it. But we have to be strong and keep on going with our message. What are we trying to get? What emotions are we trying to provoke out of people? What, what are we trying to see changed? We have to keep going forward with that um, and not let, you know, the media or the people that are strictly following the media and just taking all the information, letting some go out, letting, letting the riots control their, control their head. We can't let those people control the movement. It's the people that are actually in the front, in the forefront of it. The allies, the activists, black people, black women, and everybody. Okay, so. Running, so. Okay, so so I it, off of that point, which is well made by uh, by you, Kyle and and Michael also. Um, you know, one of the things that's coming out on this, and one of the things that uh, politicians are being asked about is this. Um, you know, this maybe it's a catchphrase. I don't know what it is. You you'll have to explain it to me a little bit more. Um, the, the idea that the Black Lives Matter 
movement wants to defund the police. And, you know, I, I feel like when most people who don't consume news on a regular basis hear that and they're like, they want to defund the police. What, what does that mean? How could I be for defunding the police? And, you know, what, what is that, what does that statement mean? What is, well, how do you feel about something like that or, or that statement? So they, there's people that are obviously in the Black Lives Matter movement that are saying defund the police. There are people not saying defund the police. There are people saying abolish the police. There are people saying right. abolish the police. Um, everybody has their own right to, to um, everybody has their own right to, to what they believe in. And I'm just reading a message from my, uh, down there from my uh, old defensive coordinator at Cortland. So, um, but anyways, we, um, what defund the police means to me is fund the community. So it means right. taking money and out reallocating and relocating that money into um, places that are needed, into organizations, community-based organizations that need the funding. Um, that's that's what defund the police really means. It, take, it, it is taking defunding the police, yes, but fund the community. That's what the term yeah. That, that we want to talk about is, is funding the communities. Um, a lot of what I do is, and what I'm trying to do in my lifetime is prevent a lot of violence, um, sexual, domestic, and gun violence. And if I could have help from police funds to do that, I would be more than happy to take that money and do it so that the police, it's less of a burden on the police. My mom was working for 30 years, 30 years in the police force. I wanted, I, would, I was praying every day that I, she came home safe, and that she, had, she didn't have to go through any problems any more than she has to. And almost every day, like when I was growing up, I would say, Mom, you catch any bad guys today? Half the time, she would be saving people. Half the time, it, was, it wasn't even about catching bad guys. But she would tell me all these little things that were, why are you getting calls for that? Why, why couldn't they handle that themselves? Why couldn't the organization handle that? Um, are the things that now growing up and being 23 years old now that I'm seeing that could be totally preventable my mom could be at the police station while the community handles it. And maybe it will bring the police into the community more if we defund the police. And that's just, that's just how, you know, defund the police, the term defund the police is really, it should be being portrayed because that's all I've been hearing from people that are pro uh, defund the police. Yeah, I, I think that's a, that's a great point. I just saw um, Charlene, is it Charlene in our chat? Just, just said defunding the police refers to uh, reallocating funds. And that's essentially what you're saying, right? I think I have an even more radical. Yeah, Mike, go ahead, go ahead. I, I think I have an even more radical of your point about that. I mean, you know, I'm a firm believer of, of saying what you mean and meaning what you say. And I think that defunding the police is the exact correct term to describe what needs to happen for police departments around the country to understand that their actions will no longer be tolerated. You know, the police department's if you look at the history of police departments in America, they simply have too much money, too much money. And, and I would push back on the notion that, you know, defunding the police would somehow lead to police departments being unable to function. I think that that's a ridiculous notion. Consider the NYPD. I mean, look at their budget. They have the third largest operating budget. You know, less money allocated to the police department, to your point, could go to some areas that will actually help. Uh, and the argument by the police department that has been that they're not going to be able to keep us safe if they're defunded, which I think is ludicrous. If we consider dollars and cents, the cut that's being asked, for example, with the NYPD is very, very modest. I think it's just about $1, mil $1 billion of their annual budget. Uh, and by the way, their annual budget went up uh, from a year ago. You know, the NYPD, which is the perfect example, they are the largest police department in the country. There's like one police officer for every 162 residents. In the last two decades, their budget has ballooned. They, they enjoy this outsized influence in city government. And, all, and it's all out of this fear that if we don't keep things the way they are, that we're going to go back to the bad days of the 70s and the 90s. But outside of the NYPD, we have to reimagine police departments because the way in which police departments function simply does not work anymore. You know, there's, there's nothing that community policing, there's nothing that working with police departments and police reform has done to solve the problem of violence against black people. We've tried them, we've tried them all and the shootings go up. You know, what we have to do is we have to end the militarization of the police departments, which if you're interested, uh, 
Radley Balco has a book called The Rise of the Warrior Cop. I would put it as mandatory reading, very, very important. It's by Radley Balco. And in that book, it talks about how did we get to this point where we have SWAT teams? How do police departments end up looking like ground troops in the military? This all has to do with the war on drugs, the war on poverty, the Clinton cops program, uh, post 9-11 reactions by the federal government, the expansion and the empowerment of police forces has come to the expense of, li of the civil liberties. And one of the major ways that we reverse that is through financially disincentivizing police departments around the country. And that's what I believe defund the police means. Yeah, guys, let me jump. I mean, I think you guys did a great job explaining that. And to viewers who maybe were unsure, uh, thank you. And I, and I think that clarifies it. Um, how do, I mean, obviously at, at some level there's gonna be policing. How, is there any way that we can try to reform policing where police and some of these, you know, more underrepresented communities can work together. Um, it feels almost like if you are, it feels almost like they're working against each other. You're either with the Black Lives Matter movement or you're pro-police. I personally don't understand why you, you need to pick one. I, I, kind of what you guys said, I think we need to work together to try to reform policing so that everyone feels protected and, and on the same side. Uh, Kyle, I think you're in a unique position to speak to that. What needs to happen for us to improve this? A lot more cops like my mom. Um, Love it. it. It's, it's uh, her, her situation, and she lived in the black community for a long time um, as a white woman. Um, she obviously didn't grow up with that. And then when she moved here, I'm sure she learned a lot. Um, and she went through a lot of things, racial problems targeted towards black people and it affected her as a white woman because of the people that she would be friends with in the times that she grew up in this community, around this community, uh, the people that she dated, um, having me, you know, black kids, three black kids. Um, her experience in life definitely helped her cause as a police officer. Um, she wasn't just a police officer. She's not just a police officer and now retired, obviously, but she would go to Malvern all the time. She showed her face all the time. She fed us all food every, every game day. Um, she was one of those people that were just, just super involved. I don't know how many cops are like my mom. Um, and I'm not sure if they ever will be like my mom. I, I really do think my mom is a super, like a super cop. But it's, it's almost as if people like her can make a big difference, you know? Like people, people that are if you're talking about uh, police reform, which is what we're talking about now, um, I believe that there is, there are ways. I just don't, I don't know if we've been going about it the best way in, in where I'm from. Um, I do think there's ways to change attitudes. There shouldn't be a one hour max, a minimum for diversity studies for police officers. There shouldn't be a one hour, two hour session talking about race relations. That's a, race relations is an ongoing everyday thing. If you spend a couple hours on it in an academy and expect these people to walk right into the black communities and not understand what's going on, not understand the problems, not understand that maybe you have a bias towards black people and you've never been, you've never been able to uncover that because the, the way your academy is set up, you're not really learning as much as my mom was able to learn by living in the black community. That's, that's important. And I know my mom was, would never let her partners or any of any, any the people in her precinct talk bad about race, talk bad about um, people of different sex, diff people of different sexualities. So I think that we just need, we do need cops to, I guess, work harder to learn and work harder to be inside the communities, even when that community is saying, get out of here. Even when that community is saying, please leave. It's up to the, an ally, a cop that wants to be an ally, um, even though as, as tough as it is, as Michael was talking about, and the, the, structure, the structure behind it all, how you actually ally if you're you know, perpetuating certain things. But it, it, if you're gonna reform police, that's what it's gonna take. It's gonna take a lot more learning, a lot more education in the police departments, a lot more accountability um, for the officers that don't follow suit. So that's, that's my take on it. I think there is a way to reform the police and, and make more police like my mom. Great answer, Kai. I love it. Um, yeah, I love that. Mike, you want to jump in? Yeah, I mean, I, I think one of the things is that we, we thought that, you know, 
we as in like the black community, there was this thought that if we had a more diverse police force, that that would end the, uh, the, the unarmed shootings that we're seeing by the police. Unfortunately, we found that that's not the case. Unfortunately, we found that diversity in the police department actually doesn't mean anything. Um, and I actually wrote, that was actually part of a paper that I wrote in law school, where you see that regardless of the diversity of the police department, there's still going to be shootings, even shootings that involve Black police officers, Black and Hispanic police mm -hmm. officers and Asian. I mean, if you look at um, the George Floyd, I mean, there was, a, there was an Asian cop w sitting there with them. So, I mean, unfortunately, we've seen that diversity does not help in the police departments. I think there is a larger structural issue with police departments that needs to be changed. And I don't know if, you know, conventional reform that we've had in the past, such as community policing, I don't think all of that uh, has been successful. I don't know if it can be successful. I think that we do have to reimagine policing. And I don't think that there's any level of diversity training. I mean, diversity training fails in corporations. Epic, epic fail. You know, I mean, we think that um, diversity training works in corporations, but I've worked for corporations and I've seen what has gone on and none of that works. So I don't think there needs to be more diversity training. I think that there needs to be a reimagining of how, what is the function of police in society? For example, you know, police have been involved in mental health uh, where they shouldn't be. They shouldn't be involved in mental health at all. That should be left to the mental health professionals, the social workers. You know, they've been called for uh, disturbances with people who are mentally unstable. And what have they done? In some cases, they've shot people. You know, we don't need, if there's a disturbance with someone who is mentally ill, we don't need a cop with a badge and a gun showing up and trying to defuse the situation. It doesn't work. It doesn't help. So, you know, we need to reallocate those resources and we need to have clear lines on what police are to be involved in and what police are not needed for. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and I think that that's very important. Right. And that's, that's huge. And you said a couple of things. Um, first off, I wanted to talk about, you said the diversification of the police force. And that's, I believe that too. Uh, I, there was a, there's an idea out there that if anything, when you get, and you're black in the police force, you don't want to, you want to show to them, you want to, it's not really a group thought, but it's more like you have to prove yourself within the black community that you're not going to take an easy on black people. Um, and another thing with George Floyd, the, the, that terrible situation, the person, the murderer of George Floyd was literally showing the two officers, the Asian officer and the other officer there, how it's done. Those people were relatively new to their jobs. So what Michael's saying is not, he's not, he's not far off at all. He's right there. He's hitting right on the head because the diversity trainings. Okay, great. This person who has been in the force for years, I'm not sure how many years he serves in the force with multiple complaints was literally showing those officers, how you can, how you handle the situation. Those officers were new to the job and he's showing them how it's done. And that's how systems continue to persist. When you, when you, when you're showing people that are young, how to how to go about things and that's how you're doing it that's where di diversity training fails diversity training is not going to solve that it's impossible it can't yeah i'm looking at a lot yeah, of our that, comments a lot of that goes back to accountability yeah. um you know accountability for things that happen but accountability in terms of training um you're 100 right i mean that the george floyd thing was obviously caught on tape had it not been caught on tape you would have had a, you know probably would have been unpunished and you'd have you know, three young officers probably doing the same thing in 20 years. Don? Yeah, I think, I, I think you guys are all talking about, um, you know, things that are systemic, right? Kyle kind of mentioned it. But diversity training doesn't beat systemic issues that have existed for, you know, a very long time. And, um, you know, Kyle, you've, you're, you're a football player. You've been on, on football teams. You know, you, you guys get a certain amount of training and then, and then all of a sudden, when, when you're out there, you're, you're with the guys or you're with the locker room, there's a certain culture, right? And you have to adapt to that culture. And that's systemic, right? That's what we're talking about. Mm -hmm. That's the problem. Yeah. Um, yeah. Go uh, ahead. Will you, one second. The best, the best football teams, and this is Coach A's in here, my, my old defensive coordinator, and I know he could attest to this. And I'm pretty sure he was the one that was really leading us to charge in this in, in, in college football for me was talking about the best teams are self-policed. 
So this, the best teams, it's not about the coaches. It's not about the coaches telling the players yeah. stop doing things. It's about the coaches saying, hey, this is our culture. And then the players have to talk to each other about, you know, making changes and, and policing each other and holding each other accountable. And I think that same thing has to be said for communities. That's great. That's great. I, you know, you, you guys are so good at this. You, I mean, we're, we're very lucky, Brian and I, I think we're, we're very lucky that we have access to just, just amazing students. You must have had really good teachers in high school. Um, <laughs> so, uh, so we, we're kind of, we're kind of running over a little on time, but we're just going to keep going because I, this, I think this conversation's great. So uh, we have 45 people in the Zoom. If you guys want to stick around, we'll, we'll, just, we'll just keep going because we have more questions and I know you guys have more questions and we want to make sure we get as much out of you guys as possible because you guys really bring a wealth of knowledge. And so I want to kind of change gears a little bit. Um, not so much though. And, and, I'll, and I'll let Kyle talk to this a little bit more. Uh, last week, there was an interaction between um, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez and um, a congressman, uh, Ted Yoho. Um, he's from, I forget where, which state he's from, he's Florida. from, but he's from Florida. Yeah. Um, uh, and AOC, of course, is from uh, New York. And um, there was an interaction where he accosted her, he cursed at her, and he, he called her, um, you know, all sorts of obscenities. Um, so after this interaction uh, between Yoho and AOC, AOC made the point about the type of language uh, used towards women by some men. Um, and what I thought about at that time, that a good question to, to ask somebody like Kyle, would be how should men who witness this type of verbal abuse react in real time? Um, you know, what's the bigger message here that she was trying to send to um, all men, men of color, uh, especially, I think, because she was trying to send a message to men of color also. What do you think, right. She was. She wasn't necessarily talking about intersection there. Um, she's talking about the male privilege over, over women, which is clear as day. If you walk outside, you know, <laughs> as a man, you could do everything you want in this, in this world. Um, not everything, but you know what I mean. And uh, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, her response was great. But like, like I tell people that I want to be allies to anything, um, it's not about, you know, it's, it's really about lifting that burden off, taking the pressure off the person that's been discriminated against. And she answered, she went back in so beautifully. Um, but it's really about, and the people he said real time that saw that and he called, you know, he called her that, uh, a word that has been used by men to degrade women in person, which is, I, is, is crazy to me. Um, cause you don't really see that often nowadays at least from what I've seen, um, somebody saying that in, in person, I usually see it behind closed doors and in groups of people, uh, oh, she's this, she's that. And it automatically takes the credibility away from that person that they're speaking on. And when they use language like uh, Yoho had, had used against her. So in real time, I don't know if I would have been able to, to keep my mouth shut and, and I probably would have said a couple of other things uh, at Yoho, um, directed towards him, and that would it would have been a kind of an ugly sight. But it's it's all it's it's really about like you know how how did he react after that? Now now that she now that he said it and people heard it, now how's your apology? What's that going to look like? And people aren't talking about the apology enough. Um, I know she is though, uh, and he did not lift the burden off of her. Uh, instead, he was absolving himself the whole entire time that he was apologizing. Um, and it reminds me, a couple of years ago, I, I was a victim of a, of a shooting, me and my friend Mike. Uh, and we survived the shooting. And I remember going through in the court cases and at the end of it, you know, finally getting justice for it. And there was no apology at all. It was, there was an apology and then it went straight to um, a, an absolving thing, you know, uh, trying to, you know, I'm doing this, I'm this, I'm this for the, the perpetrator. And it didn't, it, it didn't bring me any type of remorse. It didn't bring me to any type of feelings. Um, it, it was just like, why, why would you, 
why'd you even do that? If you were going to apologize, go all out. Um, not to say that she has to accept his apology, um, but that just goes to show that we allow this as men, we allow this kind of language all the time and we allow it to go unchecked. And then when we are caught doing it, we're allowed to just say whatever we want and, and nothing's going to happen. And that's exactly what Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez was speaking on in terms of the apology and she's been talking about being verbal about and kudos to her for staying strong during that. But there's no reason that men should be putting down women in today's day and know what happens structurally. So you definitely can't be doing that in places, in male dominated spaces specifically um, towards minority women, uh, towards a person like Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez. Yo, Kyle, can I jump in for a second? You know, I've heard you speak tonight. I've heard you speak a few times. You often talk about this word allies, that you need allies. And one of the things that was really most moving to me, other than seeing you again, and, and you know, I saw you there, Kyle. I just said, hey, Kyle, see, let me talk to him. And then all of a sudden, like, yeah, I organized this. Um, I mean, immensely impressive. And of course, you had help doing it. Um, but at the age of 23, uh, I couldn't be prouder of you. But one of the things you talked about we, and that really kind of stuck to me, you said that if black people, you know, wish this enough and if enough black people were in the movement, and you know, if it was up to black people, we would have had equality. It's not enough for black people to want equality and equality and justice. We need allies. And that's really my, my question. What can people, particularly white people, uh, do to try to be an ally of this movement? Yeah, and when I said that, I was actually, it's, it's a spinoff of, a activist that I, I love to death and I'm friend, very good friends with now. And her name is Brenda Tracy. And she's uh, a gang rape survivor who goes around the country and speaks to teams uh, and, and communities about sexual violence and her story. Um, and she allowed me to be really an, a big ally in this field in, in America in, sexual, in the sexual violence realm. But she always talks about how if women could have ended sexual violence, it, sexual violence would be kept to a minimum nowadays. But it's not. Um, and she talks about how if, if women could change it, it's, it's really up to the men to change it. And this move, the Black Lives Matter movement, yes, it's been around for many years since 2014. But when it really started picking up again, I think that I was like, wow, I came to a realization. Um, and I called Brenda and I was talking to her a couple months ago about it, um, about me being victim blamed and how we tie violence into being allies for social justice issues. Um, I was victim blamed for getting shot. Um, I was victim blamed because I was hanging around. And this is, this is important for allies to hear stories and then repeat them. But when I was shot, after a couple weeks later, I was at work and a person came up to me and they were all sorry for what had happened, you know, and then all of a sudden it came to a point where they said, oh, you shouldn't be hanging around them goon, um, them goons, sorry, them goons. And I'm like, goons? My, my friends are goons, what, what are you trying to say? And it was like, well, you know, it wouldn't be happening if, you know, and it's like, oh, my friends are black, just say it. It's because my friends are black, you don't have, you don't have the, the guts to say it. Um, and that hurts, that hurt me tremendously. And I, I always thought about that and I never knew how to really put my words about how it felt until the Black Lives Matter movement started. It's super empowering for, for uh, black people in this, in this movement. And it should be empowering. That same fierce energy and that same power should feel empowering for white people. It's hard to talk about something for the first time. It's always so hard to talk about something, especially when it comes to social justice issues. When it comes to having privilege, it's hard the first time. So I'm telling people now that if you want to be on the right side of history, you have to get rid of that first time. Go about it. If you have a racist family member, say this is the day and do it. Within five seconds, if you think something in your head, Within five seconds, go ahead and do it. Say, no, that's not true. That's not right. You shouldn't be thinking about black people that way. You shouldn't be thinking about the LGBTQ in that, in that way. You shouldn't be doing that. You should and talk about it. Once you get it out that first time, you actually build a deeper connection with who you're talking with because you're being real with them. You don't want somebody that's just going to pat you on the back all the time and you just have to tiptoe and walk in eggshells around uh, that person. Being an ally is getting it out that first time so that you could do it again and again and again. Yeah, great yeah, point. Yeah, it's, it's really great. Mike, what do you think about uh, being an ally in this, uh, in this 
in all of these movements, well, especially I, I, with the Black Lives Matter. I think that if white people want to be allies, they have to encourage the conversations of racial justice and equity to proceed, and they should not seek to hinder or, you know, speak away those conversations from happening. I think if you've, the other thing that needs to happen is, you know, white people have to find a way to dismiss their own fragility. You know, if you've ever read right, White Fragility by Robert J. D'Angelo, you know exactly what I'm talking about. I think that for white people to become an ally, they have to acknowledge their privileges in society and they have to stop taking the narrative personally because the attack has never been on white people as an individual. It's rather mm -hmm. an attack and critique of the structural inequalities that white people benefit from. So I think the only way to be an ally is to acknowledge your privilege, to help further the conversation, to allow equity for black people. And what equity means is for allowing the system to change in a way that promotes an even playing field. Because I think the common misconception is that, oh, well, you know, people of color, black people are looking for advantages and they're looking for handouts. No, what we're looking for is equity. We're looking for a society where we don't have to work twice as hard as white people to get recognized for our work. That's what we're talking about. And of course, education is vital. And I think that there, there's a lot of people out there that think that they're experts on race until they open their mouths and you can tell they have no idea what they're talking about. So I think that, you know, it's an education that needs to happen. Okay. That's, I mean, that's excellent. It, that's, it's a, a, a lot of good points. Um, and I, I think, um, I think what Brian and I, uh, before we brought you guys in, we were talking about a little bit about, Brian, I'm going to let, um, I'm going to kind of merge the last two questions that okay. we have, because I think they're very similar. Because I think um, as, as older people, right, uh, you know, uh, Brian and I are the same age. Um, for those of you who are wondering, uh, we're both, we're, we're going to be 40 next year. We're going to be 40 yeah. next year. Thanks. Um, and, and what's pretty awesome we talked about before was that Brian was Mike's teacher when he was Kyle's age, which is yeah. pretty amazing too. Um, <laughs> so, uh, so, you know, one of the things that I, I want to kind of uh, transition this conversation to in our last question, I, I saw this poll as part of the Fox News poll there was a question about whether Americans um, that they polled thought that kneeling for the anthem was uh, kneeling for the national anthem, like of course Colin Kaepernick did. And uh, you know, according to my updates, apparently the entire Utah Jazz coaches and players and the uh, the Pelicans, whatever city they're from, New Orleans, um, they they all kneeled tonight. And this is so interesting to me because according to this poll. And we don't have it up, but uh, they asked the question, do you think kneeling for the anthem is appropriate? And in September 2016, when they polled Americans, 32% thought it was appropriate, while 61% thought it was inappropriate. In 2017, it was 41 to 55. And as of this month, July 2020, 48% um, of Americans think it is appropriate, while only 44% percent think it's inappropriate. So, um, you know, I think what, um, what the Black Lives Matter movement is talking about with police brutality and things like that is definitely affecting a lot of people and minds are changing. Where do you guys go from here, right, Brian? What, where do you think, what's your question on that? My question? Well, it's it's sort of our both of our questions. Yeah, right? I mean, I, I think yeah, I think we've seen some progress. I think now, you know, too often society once things are out of the news cycle, it's forgotten and things revert yeah, back right. to the way they were. So, you know, how do we keep things going? And then I guess I'll time with my question. Yeah, you know, we always talk about and, and when I was at the Unity March, you know, the, people were talking about voting. You got to go vote, and yet young people, people your guys' age, historically don't go out and vote. Is that going to change this year? Where does the movement go? And can we count on these young people uh, to, to, to have their voices heard at the polls this November? Mike, okay. you want to jump on that? Well, I understood the second question. I wasn't sure what the first question was. Well, how do you keep the progress of this movement going? Well, I think how you keep the progress of this movement going is 
number one, you got to stay in the news. You got to stay in the news cycle because the media is where most people uh, consume uh, their information, uh, social media and things of that nature. And I think also how you keep this going is you influence all aspects of society. You know, you have to, you have to figure out, you know, the Black Lives Matter movement could do more to, you know, reach the older generation as much as possible. Continue to push and push and push and figure out, you know, what, what are the different avenues that we can use to continue to keep ourselves in the news, to continue to keep ourselves uh, relevant in society so that people don't just move on and say, oh, well, this was just another, this was like Occupy Wall Street, you know, just another uh, movement that will disappear from the news cycle and no one else will talk about again. Um, and keeping, and the issues will always be relevant. So it's not a matter of keeping the issues relevant. I think it's a matter of how do we keep people's attention in a society where, you know, people are gone in 20 seconds if you don't reach the point. I, I think that, that that's the challenge. And social media is a challenge with that too, because social media can be a great tool and it can be, it can be terrible. We have to find a way to get rid of all of the uh, disinformation, all the information that is just not true. There's too many people who are walking around with, uh, with notions and with things that are just not, we, we have to be able to call what is false, false. I, I think we don't get to choose our own facts. And we've reached that point in society, unfortunately, where people are picking and choosing what they want to believe. And we have to find a way to dismiss that. With regard to voting, you know, voting may be one mechanism to, to, to in, invoke change, but I think that where young people in particular are disenchanted in the feeling where they have to decide between folks who they don't believe in. And it's a question of, well, does voting even do anything? Because it's no secret that guys like Joe Biden don't necessarily represent the young people's ideal choice. You know, he is what you would call an establishment politician. And it's a question of, do we need more of the same old politicians who've been around for years and years and years and ask for votes while still doing the bare minimum? And I, I think that if we ask for more from politicians, if we cannot ask for more from politicians, then it shouldn't surprise us that young people would rather sit out on the voting. And what I think that we need, instead of calling out for more votes, is we need to call for a cultural change in America. Because listen, we've had Republican and Democratic administrations and the plight of black people remain. Mm. So something has to give. And, and I think that saying, well, if the young people turned out, then et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Unfortunately, I kind of think that that's a little disingenuous to be honest with you. Because when you consider the valid critiques of the Electoral College and the problems that people are having with voting all over the country due to the voting restrictions, which seem to be a Republican ploy to block millions from voting, what I actually believe, where I actually believe that voting is critical is on the local level. If we want to see immediate change and we want voting to be part of it, do it on the local level, um, more so than the president. You know, young people don't want to see more of the same. And I think that we need to stop pushing voting as if it's our savior. And we need to look towards the ways in which we can change cultural attitudes in the United States. Because I think that what we really need is a mindset change. We need to rethink the way we see policing. We need to rethink the way we see equity. We need to figure out how we're going to end the inequalities in our society that have to do with housing, education, transportation, food justice. And you know what? Voting is not the silver bullet to resolve those problems. So I think what we need is an attitude adjustment. We don't need more politicians. Interesting answer, Mike. Uh, really, um, really well said. Kyle, I do want to bring you in as an activist, as somebody obviously organized that march and somebody who's involved in this. Uh, where do you go from now with this? Well, first, I want to mention that it's going to be a tough um, election for thousands and th upon thousands of people um, in, in respects to uh, sexual violence. Um, obviously, both candidates that are running for president now have allegations surrounding them. Um, I've only been able to meet Joe Biden and talk to Joe Biden um, way before the allegations were out. Um, I, I, pre I appreciate that it's on us. Um, and what they do with Tracy Vitcher is leading that, leading that charge uh, behind the Joe Biden's uh, campaign, uh, sort of on the back burner. And we, I do see that the work that they put into end sexual violence and domestic violence, I think those are huge problems in America now that don't get enough spotlight. Um, I want to make sure that people understand um, that sexual violence is, has been 
turning people, hurt people, hurt people, that term, you've heard that term. Sexual violence is one of those things that, you know, causes more violence, um, causes more gun violence, domestic violence causes more uh, problems, mental health issues, mental health issues lead to other problems. And to have to vote um, for two people that have multiple allegations of sexual violence around them, that's not going to be an easy vote for anybody. Um, and I'm sure literally everybody has been affected by sexual violence in some way, whether it was family, friends, or them. Um, so that's, that's really tough um, to go about. And, and how do we go about handling that? How do you go about going into a ballot and looking and saying, okay, my next leader has this surrounding them? Um, so I definitely wanted to just touch on that. Um, but yeah, it's like Mike said, we have to vote local. And for me, it's, and since it's been generations of our age not voting, um, how, how do we make it cool to vote is what I'm, I guess I would go about saying since Mike handled that so well. How do we make it cool to vote? How do we get people to vote? Um, and we say that all the time. Um, and I don't, I don't, I'm not an expert on any of this, but I literally, I literally have no, I don't have an answer for it. But it is about, in my opinion, my activism goes through sports so that I could get a lot of people involved. A lot of people want to make a difference in their communities. And a lot of people like sports, so I tie the two together. Maybe I could do better on my end and, and hold myself accountable at, to get people in my community to vote. Maybe by through, through sports, maybe have vo voting drives, um, something. And I'll definitely keep in touch with you if I find a solution to that. Yeah, I love it. I mean, not only is it, you know, make it cool to vote, but maybe make it cool to run for a local office or for government. You know, like you guys said, I think we need better people uh, leading us and, and kind of helping us here. Uh, great answer, guys. Thank you. Yeah, I don't know about you, Brian, but uh, honestly, just after just talking to these two young men, you know, I'm, I feel more hopeful and more confident. And we we can cannot contain all of the stuff that they're saying in our one hour session. So there's just so much to be talked about. But really, you guys have done an awesome job. What um what I want to do right now is actually just open it up to the people that are in attendance that are in our Zoom chat. And I know you guys have been asking questions and chatting throughout, but um, I'd like to actually encourage anyone who has questions to do so through audio or video, um, to actually just speak out your question that you may have had earlier or um, uh, that have right now. I think Charlene, uh, you've been uh, pretty uh, engaged throughout. Do you, have a, do you have a question you'd like to ask uh, uh, Michael or Kyle? Or a thought, or a thought about uh, what they've done tonight. I think that it's encouraging that as two young people, and hi to both of you. I don't know if I was your counsel in Malvern, but um, it's encouraging to see young people get involved. But the first thing that I would like to say is, please, 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 do not discourage anyone from voting in the. Um, election, the presidential election. Yes, locally is important and actually more important, but if we don't want four more years of the same, then we have to get everyone living and breathing to go out to the polls and vote for a change in government. We know what the other choice is, but sometimes there are two choices that are not the best, but one is better than the other. The other quick thing I like to say is that the funding of the police department, and Michael, you handle it pretty well, it does not mean taking all the money from the police. You cannot, as the old folk expression, throw out the baby with the bathwater. There are thousands and thousands of good police officers. The defunding does not mean taking all the money from the police department. It means reallocating it to what you guys were talking about. Let the mental health professionals do the mental health work. Let the social workers do the social work. Let the regular counselors do the counseling work. I could talk for two hours, but I'll let somebody else talk. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks, Charlene. Thank you so much. Um, do we, do you guys, Alan, Alan, Alan Thompson? Anybody really who wants to, uh, we're really inviting any of you to, um, do what Charlene just did, or just ask a quick question or a comment or whatever you have. Yeah, uh, I just had a comment earlier about just kind of getting to the heart of the issue with the police, police 
abuse of power, right? And I, I, it seems to me that the main issue is that there's things that police officers can get, can and have gotten away with, right? That, that disproportionately affects people of color. But because of that, you know, the main issue being police officers getting away with it, I think a lot of the, and I guess the question is, do you guys agree with this? But I think a lot of the pressure, there should still be more pressure on, I think that is what it is, on the legislative branches and the judicial branches, actually. Like really the judicial branches. There's a lot that goes on in law and in judging the law that gives citizens who have the job of, you know, being a police officer, gives them more just immunity from certain things that other citizens don't have, that's just not fair. And it gives them a certain sense of power and they're not elected, they're not, you know, they're not checked or balanced in any sort of way. I think that's kind of, that will be the real root of the issue. You know, I mean, you, a lot of it's like, a lot of the Black Lives Matter is the feeling and the, you know, the true observation that there's, there is a disproportionate um, just dislike or, or distrust in black and sp black males particularly. But it, as long as people are held accountable for it, it would feel, it wouldn't feel as bad as it does. So is it, do you, do, do you guys agree that it's really the checks and balance, it's really on the judiciary and the legislator to hold the executive accountable for the authority that they, we give them? I definitely, okay, I think that's sorry. in your wheelhouse, right? Yeah, yeah. I, no, I, I, think, I, I think you're hinting at uh, quali qualified immunity. And um, definitely we have to get rid of that. Uh, we, we have this culture in the United States where we kind of assume that police officers are, that we assume they don't lie. We assume they're always telling the truth. We assume that they're, you know, that they're always upstanding citizens and that they're not defending their own self-interest. And I think that's what I mean by, we have to change that narrative and change that culture because we've seen so many cases where a police officer will lie on the stand, I mean, we have to make it so that police officers are held to the same standards that, you know, all public officials need to be held. They need to be held to higher standards. We don't dilute the standards just because we love police. You know, I, I think that that's one thing we need to change. With regard to the law, when you're talking about prosecutors, that is a big problem because, of course, the, the prosecutors work hand in hand with the police departments. They don't want to do anything that's going to ruin that relationship. So of course, that's why you don't really see prosecutors, um, you don't really see prosecutors wanting to indict cops because they, that, that's, that's a messy thing. You don't wanna, the prosecutors don't wanna get involved in that. They don't wanna ruin the relationship because they need the police in all elements of you know, their investigations and in their cases. So definitely something has to be done in the judiciary with regard to you know, how prosecutors and how uh, police officers, how that relationship is, because frankly, it is a conflict of interest. Um, it's a conflict of interest the way we see the relationship between prosecutors and, um, and police, especially when we consider, when we talk about grand juries. So that's a big issue. So I think you, you definitely hit the nail on the head when you talked about that, because we need 100% accountability and we're not getting it and we haven't gotten it. And there's so many areas of structure with regard to the law and the judiciary that make it so that the police's opinion and the police's, how, how they function is taken for granted to always be right. And we need to change that. Thank you. Um, you know, one of the questions that I'm seeing uh, throughout and one of the questions that Brian and I spoke about, um, you know, we're both educators. We're not saying that we're experts on politics or race relations or anything like that. Our job is to teach kids, you know, how to be functional members of society. And uh, one of the things that we've seen is that there's quite a bit of racism in schools. And, um, you know, and so I, it's kind of two questions and maybe Kyle, you can talk about this. Um, you know, how, how, how would you talk to a student who's facing racism in, um, in, in a school setting, you know, um, from fellow classmates or maybe they're viewing it as a systemic racist system, right? Maybe they're viewing their education is not teaching them what they need to know uh, to be, you know, 
I, I don't know. I, I'm just trying see. to get at. Yeah, you see yeah. what I'm trying to get at? Yeah, yeah. Um, well, first, I want to think about when you first said somebody is facing racism, my immediate thought was, oh, a black, a black boy facing racism. And I think I have to unlearn that thought, uh, primarily because when we talk about intersection of sexuality, race, gender, um, if, and, and socioeconomics, I'm gonna start, I want to phrase this one as like a, if someone was a black woman um, facing racism in a school, um, let's say a queer, a queer black woman at that. Um, we, they, queer about, we're, we already know the problems with, with, with how people view the LGBTQ plus um, and we know that, and, and if, if you're denying that, then, I mean, listen, I, I don't know what you, what do you walk outside for, walk down the block for, you know, a mile and, and see if you heard a homophobic slur or something. Um, Cause I, you, I bet you, you probably will. Um, but it, uh, for this queer black woman, um, we have to kind of look at her as a whole, as a collective, as a person that's facing discrimination as a whole, you can't just say, oh, but yeah, she's rich, right? Maybe she's queer, black woman and rich. Well, yeah, she's rich, but you have to look at her as a whole, right? And how your language and how your verbiage is being used against her to put her down. Um, we, we have to keep on talking about being intersectional, like talk about how we view things as intersectional and how uh, power constructs are, are um, always at play when we're talking about interactions with people in general. Every interaction you have, there's a different power dynamic. You have to be able to learn those. Um, if you see somebody that's been discriminated against, that, that queer black uh, young woman who has to have money, um, you have to be thinking about her in your best interests. And what do you tell her? You, you, don't, you, don't, you don't provide sympathy, you provide empathy. Um, you don't, I would not know what she's going through. I would not know how those words are affecting her. How would I? It's impossible. You don't need to know everything. You don't need to be an expert to see that there's something clearly wrong. But what you do is you go to her and you support her. You listen. You listen to her. Um, and you, you say, listen, I'm here for you. Or you don't, you don't go to her and say, oh, that sucks. Oh, that must blow. No, you say, you say I'm here for you. Um, is there, what, what, I want to I wanna be here for you. I'm going to help you. I'm going to find what I can. I'm going to find whatever I can do to help you. And you don't just say it. You go about action steps. You look up on Google. Everybody has, not everybody has access to internet. I know that's, that's, that's a fact as well. But there are ways to help. And if you have access to internet in this day and age, if you have access, go on Google, go on Safari, type it up. You have connects. You have contacts. You have people that, are, that may know more than you on the subject. You have access to a phone. I know pay phones aren't around, but a lot of people have cell phones, right? So we, you, you could contact people. There's information readily available for a lot of people, um, especially people with power, uh, have resources to find information to help out. Don't burden her because she faced racism. Don't burden her with, why does that hurt you so much? Why does that affect you so much? Why are you being so sensitive? Rather, huh, I wonder why she's so sensitive. Let me go out of my way and not burden her. Great answer, great answer. Mike, do you have uh, anything to add to I, I think that the the sad thing about education in particular is that, you know, racism is ingrained in the structure of education, particularly public education uh, in the United States. And so much money is spent. Uh, if, you, if you look at the New York City public school system, so much more money is spent on punishing than on rewarding and on helping kids to learn. There were, when I was in high school, there were just too many police officers. It was unnecessary. You know, you had metal, you, you already, the way, the structure of the way the school was designed already made you feel like you were in prison. And when the system makes you feel like you're in prison, you're not surprised by the things that you see. We're, they're, they're, you're not encouraging students with learning. You're encouraging students with, you know, possibly getting into the prison, uh, in, into the uh, school to prison pipeline, which is what we see. We see too many black children getting suspended for things just because the educational professional can't handle the, uh, the, the uh, disciplinary situation. You know, things that maybe a white child wouldn't be punished for. Police getting involved in situations with, with school children 
where they should not be getting involved. You know, if two children have a fight, you know, they should not be walked out of the building in handcuffs. I mean, schoolhouse fights have been going on for since as long as schools have been around. Why are these cops in the schools to arrest black children? It, do, it doesn't make sense. You know, and we have to we have to get rid of those things. We have to take cops out of the schools. We have to take them out of the picture. We have to obviously make sure that children are safe in school, but there are better ways to do it. And we have to make sure that the children can learn and that they're not wondering, you know, when is the next suspension going to come? When is the next? We have to relearn uh, the, the systematic racism that's going on in education. And teachers and, and, and administrators have to be allies to their students. And what we don't need are teachers who are quick to call in security and quick to call in cops when something happens in the classroom. Because all you're doing is you know, putting that kid in a situation. Now that kid has to deal with the criminal justice system where they don't need to be. You know, there's a lot of things that are going on with children. I mean, I mean, I know in the high school that I went to, there were a lot of children with uh, issues that were going on at home. And while it is obviously a big burden to expect the teachers to help, I think the teachers have to do a better job and the educators and the administrators of understanding what is going on. It is a battle. It is war for a lot of children. I mean, there's so many New York State public school students who are homeless. You have to come to school and you have to deal with homelessness. You have to deal with wondering where your next meal is going to come from. You know, and on top of that, you have police who are ready to, to, to take you out of the building in handcuffs. It's too much. It's too much. Like, let me just ask you, did New York City take the police out of the schools? I feel like I, I read that recently. Maybe they're working towards doing it now. I, I, yeah, I, I know. Within the last couple of months, I believe that I saw that. And I'm yeah. Sure we, yeah, I wish you would certainly speak to your point, and I think that if, I agree. if that's the case, then that's great. You know, Don't because that, out, that's but I one. Do believe I read that. That's one very important step. One very important step, because oh. students should be able to get in trouble without police getting involved. They should be able to. Fights have to be resolved within the school. They don't need the criminal justice system involved. You know, kids always fought. Kids always got into mischief. They don't need police involved in that. You know, kids are getting punished for things that are mundane, things that just happen, you know, and kids are getting yeah. thrown behind, behind bars for it. It's unnecessary. Yeah, I think it's different. When, I, I think um, people are saying, or the police are viewing it or society is viewing it differently if inner city kids are doing it as opposed to if suburban kids are doing it, right? Mike, that's what you're saying? Right. I mean, because I don't know, I don't know what's, what's going on at, at, at Malvern, but I mean, I can speak to experiences of being a New York City public school student in an area where, you know, the high school was in a predominant, I would say, once you go up in number, the way the Rockaways works, the higher you go in number, the whiter the neighborhood gets. So, you know, and a lot of parents were not saying that they're, they were not going to send their kids to Beach Channel. It wasn't going to happen, the parents that lived in the neighborhood. Um, but once they changed things up, they closed Beach Channel down formally, they split it up into different schools, and I think it was an effort to try to bring white people in the community to bring their children back into the public school system in that area. Um, but it was at the expense of the education of all children. Um, Sonny, I think uh, Sonny had a question or a comment um, that they'd like to share. We just wait one um, second. Yeah. Oh. Is, there, is there any way we could just one second? Because this is really important. Oh, so yeah. Go ahead, Kyle. Right. Sure. Um, and then we'll get back to that. Uh, my, my friend, Joel Stewart from um, Cornell Law School, he just sent a link in here. And uh, this was actually something that we were, we grew up in Malvern. And uh, Mike said that he didn't know exactly what was going on in the suburbs. And it doesn't look how it looks in the city. Uh, but when it is a black school, you know, there's going to be different precautions taken. And even when there's, you know, if there is are that things that are bad necessarily going on, we didn't have police in the school that are sending us out of, out of school in handcuffs. But what we did have uh, were, if you look inside the chat, uh, 2007, 2008, uh, from the LI Herald, um, 500 suspensions at Malvern High School, uh, over, is that? Yeah, 500 suspensions at Malvern High School, uh, and the school obviously has a total of 500 students. Um, it, it was it was a little weird and growing up and, and having an older sibling going to a school like that um i we all knew it had its problems and when mr china came and when you came things were much better and i know you probably heard of the progress uh from malvern and lakeview community um 
but that is something that it's it's not just about it's not just in the cities it happens in minority schools um pretty much in the suburbs and i'm sure it happens elsewhere as well yeah I, you know what kyle um first of all jules shared that article with me when he was in 11th grade uh in study hall so he's been using that article for a while uh as his uh as his piece of evidence but i think i think that's why things have started to change because you have students who are willing to have this conversation and also i think you're having you have teachers who are willing to listen um and 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 have this conversation right brian w would you say that's correct I mean, yeah, I, I mean, listen, I think it's amazing. We've been here for over an hour and a half. We have former students, we have community members, we have teachers, we have counselors. Um, and listen, credit to everyone. It, it's yeah. a beautiful it really summer night and, and everyone's here. And yeah. I, I can't tell you what a treat it is for me to sit here for an hour and a half and me sit here and actually be educated and learn from right. two, you know, magnificent students who I once taught. Um, so yeah, I would yeah. like to think that what we're doing right now is, is part of the solution. Yeah, that's what it's all about. So, Sonny, okay, go go ahead, Sonny, with your question. Oh, hey, I just wanted to address a point about what kind of communities cops fail to protect. For instance, um, just as often as men of color are three times more likely to be shot, while men, women of color are three times less likely to report being sexually assaulted, and in terms of being falsely accused of a crime that it's not addressed enough that i that you could that i as a woman of color could just go down the street and do anything eat sleep drink water and i would have the cops called on me and it's just very upsetting and misguided because it's like when a woman reports a sexual assault it's going to be a slow process and they won't believe her now, you may not think that these two points are related, but it's just so upsetting and misguided because the fact is that not a lot of guys understand this or know this, but men are more likely to be raped than falsely accused of rape. And people of color in general are more likely to be, to have the cops called on them for just doing nothing. This, these are just white civilians. so. It's just, I feel like we should just have something that also reaches white civilians. It's just upsetting and stressful. Just, and I believe it's very important that we emphasize on misogyny and homophobia as much as we do racism. Otherwise, we're dismissing this community of pe gay people of color, trans women and women of color because the fact is that people of color are generally less likely to report sexual assault or violent crimes against them. And the same thing goes for LGBT plus. And it's just this, it doesn't only hurt black people really, because the Larry Nazar case, it was just one man who damaged thousands of lives. If you think about their future kids, their families, their spouses, Harvey and his 60 women, but really he ruined hundreds of lives if you factor in their parents, their future children. And it's just so upsetting. And what people forget is that being a slave, being black, means literally being raped over and over and over again and just having kids with your slave owner or rapist or not feeling able not being able to report it because no one cares and it's important and i do believe that it's important that when men do talk about sexual assault instead of being more con concerned about false allegations be more concerned about the rape victims because it's an obvious ratio ratio because people of color disabled people immigrants lgbt plus we're just always the hurt majority mm. and it's so upsetting and sometimes it's not only by white cops it's sometimes internal at home abuse and yeah i just wanted to say that cops don't only fail black people they fail lgbt plus survivors mm. and just immigrants and basically everyone who isn't a straight white male and acknowledging my and 
this whole thing made me acknowledge my privilege, even though I know that's a lot to say. I mean, I don't, it's weird saying that, but I remember on this Instagram live, this girl, this white woman in a wheelchair realized that she had privilege as a white person instead of, because she's white and disabled instead of being black and disabled. And that really hit personally for me since my father is black and disabled. And I never thought of him as black and disabled. And it's just, um, I read stories on black and black disabled individuals have receiving excessive force, just the, the stories. And I always figured, you know, I had it, my dad would have it easier since he's disabled and wouldn't get hurt. And it's, it's just a little, it's, it's overwhelming. But the point is that it's important for us to be equally concerned about misogyny and homophobia and take them both as seriously. And that being black, being a person of color is also very much synonymous to being affected by sexual violence. And thank you, Sonny. For, yeah. um, thanks, Sonny, for sharing. That's, that's, um, that's really impactful. Kyle? Yeah. yeah so, Sonny, and I appreciate, appreciate all that because what you're saying um, is we have to be talking about intersectionality. We have to be talking about the different dynamics that each and every individual have so that we can under, uncover our privilege and uncover, um, you know, the power that we might have in, in, in certain situations. Like you said, you were talking about ableism. I didn't even mention ableism when I was talking about my example from before, but ableism is certainly a privilege. Um, I was able to, I, playing football is a privilege for me. And I, I don't know what I would do without it. Um, and I knew I had privilege. I could do different things that people that are disabled or not able to do certain things can't, obviously. Um, and you were talking about sexual violence in terms of uh, the LGBTQ plus community, uh, black men being raped. Um, it's important that us as people and especially activists doing this work or advocates doing this work, that we center people in the LGBTQ plus community, indigenous women, um, black women, and black women who have been at the forefront. Even Rosa Parks was a part of um, starting pretty much prevention efforts um, in her time for sexual violence. But every time it's, uh, for the Me Too movement per se, um, it's founded by Toronto Burke, a black woman. When I think of Me Too, it's almost as if I automatically have a white, maybe like a white young girl or like a white, maybe 30 year old girl, woman. Um, and I, you know, not like right off the bat, and that's what I automatically think when I, th when I hear Me Too. And I know that's what, not what Toronto Burke was aiming for. Um, I know it, it's, one, it's a case of a black woman's a movement or struggle, kind of not really, not necessarily being hijacked. Some people could use whatever language they want, but almost be centered around white, being white. Um, we need to make sure that we're centering the people who are further, when it comes to intersectionality, who have less privilege, we have to censor those people. And it's very similar to the Black Lives Matter movement because if we're sent, when we censor Black Lives Matter, and I'm, I'm sure a lot of us have saw the, the fists, right? That the, there's a diagram of fists and what Black Lives Matter, what they think it means versus what it actually means um, because we are here. We have to censor this fist. We have to censor our focus on this fist to bring it up. I'm not even focusing, I'm focusing right here on this fist to bring it up. So when we talk about sexual violence, uh, and, and talk about racism, you can't talk about sexual violence. And I actually learned this from Dr. Keith Edwards, who has a TED talk on YouTube um, about sexual violence. I, I recommend that people tune into that. It was, it, was, it was very educational for me as a young activist three years ago, I watched that. Um, but he, he came to Cortland and spoke one time and he said, you cannot be anti-rape, anti-sexual assault if you're not anti-racism. Or if you're if you're anti if you're not anti homophobic, you have to be anti homophobic. You have to be anti racism in order to be anti rape. You can't just say, oh, people that be uh, sexually assault people should be arrested or put in jail or beaten up or whatever. It's okay, but you know, do you see how things happen? How do you, how do we get to that point? What are the roots to get to that point? So you have to be anti everything else when it comes to social justice. You have to be anti 
uh, degrading of somebody with less privilege and before you even talk about sexual violence, which is what Sonny's point was there. We were talking about the LGBTQ+, talking about being intersectional and how different factors affect each individual person and how even police officers use, abuse their power, aren't held, aren't held accountable, and black women don't feel trust in, in the police force because for whatever reason, they're looked at as less victim than a white woman. All right, guys, um, I think we are, um, we're gonna be out of time right now. I think we've had just, a, just an amazing discussion. I, I think this has far exceeded our expectations, right, Brian? I think these guys have done an awesome job. Um, and right, Brian, what do you yeah, think? Yeah, I mean, I think everyone right? has. I mean, those people who have come here, the comments have been great. Yeah, it's and been great. And of course, great. Mike and Kyle, you guys have been great. So it's, and it's really Mike, I wanna, Thank you. Yeah, Mike, I want to give you um, sort of the last word on this. How about that? <laughs> you I mean, to do that? Wait, I don't know. Hold on. You... Before you do that, do you agree to doing that? I mean, I don't think I need to have the last word at all. I mean, the only comment that I wanted to make was that yeah. I'm so happy to hear the word intersectionality uh, yeah. come out because, that was great, you know, that work by, by Professor Kimberly Crenshaw, uh, right. that work on intersectionality is so important and understanding the dynamic of somebody not just being black, but being a black woman or being a black queer woman, all those elements are so important. And it's so vital in understanding, you know, how do we move forward in these movements? We have to understand intersectionality. And, and I remember reading about intersectionality, the, my first article that I read by uh, Kimberly Crenshaw, uh, both an undergrad, and we talked about it a lot when I took critical race theory in law school, but it's so great to hear other people uh, who, are, who may not even have a law background speaking in terms of intersectionality. So that's very, very, I'm very, very happy to hear that. And we're seeing the same thing in the feminist movement as well. And, you know, the feminist movement has turned into, you know, you know white feminism and where we should, be all, we should be focused on people who are marginalized. We should be focused on black women as well. We shouldn't forget that a woman is not just a woman. There's black women. There's black women who are members of the LGBT community. All of those elements are important. And sometimes feminism, uh, traditional feminism, for, forgets that. Uh, so I think that, that th those are very important things to remember. All right, guys. Well, thank you, Michael. Thank you, Kyle. Thank you, everybody, for joining us tonight. Um, I, yeah, absolutely. Uh, go ahead. Zan linked all of the books uh, that you guys mentioned. You guys did an amazing job. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, we hope to have you guys back on. Um, you I would know, love if to. you guys are okay with that. I would love uh, to. Because we, we're going to need to continue this discussion to November and beyond. Um, so for everybody that joined us tonight, um, have, have a great night. But before you go, just please, please, please leave us your email address in the chat so that we can send you an email about, um, about uh, you know, upcoming shows, upcoming town halls. Also, what I'd like you guys to do is, of course, uh, send us an email at, um, what is it? What is the email address? Is it Don in China at gmail.com? Don in China at gmail.com. Send us an email. Tell us what you think about what we did tonight um, and some, some topics for future episodes and future town halls. Uh, have a great night, everybody. Thank you again, Kyle and Michael. And Thank we'll you see you all us. soon. So much. Thank you well. everyone for joining. Appreciate all right. Bye. Good night. Good night.